This meeting is called uh, Sleaze and the Crisis of Capitalism, and I'd like to introduce Paul Foote, who's been a member of the Socialist Workers' Party now for 34 years, and is a well-known author in... Uh, doesn't look that old, does he, comrades? <laughs> In his youth, he's managed to be a well-known author. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. A well-known author and journalist, and he's now writing for Private Eye, The Guardian, and Socialist Workers. So I'd like to introduce Paul Foote. Um, a couple of... Weeks ago, the Archbishop of Canterbury made a speech to the nation, which I'm sure you will have read. <laughs> he said that it was time to take a moral stand. The problem with this country, he said, is that too many people no longer know what is right and what is wrong. On the very day that he made that speech, a report was published from the House of Commons Social Security Committee into a property scandal in which there was a plan to build a theme park near Ashford in Kent. And two crooked property speculators at the height of the property boom in 1989 got together to see whether they could build this theme park. There was no planning permission. There was no work done for it. But they got together to see how they could do it. And what they needed was a lot of money to get the scheme off the ground. So they teamed up with the only rich organization that they could find who would advance them the money against no security whatsoever except the possibility of making an extremely quick profit in an extremely short of time. That organization was the Church of England. <laughs> in whose offices are the offices of Chesterton's, one of the big blue-blooded estate agents, that run property in this country. And Chesterton's, together with the church commissioners, got together and reckoned that the scheme with the two crooks was a very good one to go into. And month by month, they poured money into the bank accounts of the crooks, so that at the end of 12 months, they had wasted 80 million pounds without a single penny to show for it. The property crooks went bust and left the church with a useless piece of land and 80 million pound down the tubes. The first report of the Common Social Security Committee into this scandal reckoned that one billion pounds had been lost by the Church of England uh, in gambling on property uh, in the Thatcher years. And uh, uh, the Church are busy making that up by sacking curates and vicars all over the country. And I'm telling this story not to excite you to rush out of here to set up a campaign to defend the jobs of vicars and curates. In general, I think the less of them, the better. But simply to expose a little corner of the way in which our rulers, in all the different areas in which they rule us, are constantly going on about how terrible corruption is, the hypocrisy of people who complain about corruption and yet constantly engage in it. Now, the word sleaze, it's difficult to find its origin. It doesn't really have an origin, but somebody's done some work, the sort of work they do in academia nowadays, where they go into databases and work things out. And they found that in 1985, in the national press, there were 21 references to the word sleaze. And in 1995, there were, coincidentally, 1995 references to the word sleaze. It has gone up by several million percent, whatever it is. Uh, partly that increase is down to the sexual behavior of uh, cabinet ministers, which I'll say nothing about except to remind you of the magnificent quote of John Redwood when he stood against the prime minister this time last year and said that he was going to question all his male cabinet ministers. There probably wouldn't be any female ones anyway, but he was going to question all his male cabinet ministers before he appointed them to see whether they were having an affair with anyone. And he gave as his reason this wonderful quotation which ought to be put up in gold above his offices. If a man is prepared to betray his wife, he is equally likely to betray his country. <laughs> mm. 
mostly this increase in sleaze represents a quite staggering increase in greed and corruption at the top of our society over the last 10 years. And I'm just going to pick out a few examples. Two new developments in the area of what we might call fat cats. That's quite a, a common expression now to describe very rich people. They've been around all the time, but there have been two new developments in these last 10 years about them. First of all, this business of the remuneration committees. The idea of the remuneration committee, I'm just putting their argument for a moment, is that you have a lot of non-executive directors who are by instinct fair because they're non-executive directors and therefore are the best people to get round and decide what their chairman and the other directors who are executive directors have to be paid. Do you understand that? You can understand that. They're, they're the fair ones, the sort of unfair ones at the top. Obviously, you can't decide your own salary, so you get your fellow colleagues on the board to decide your salary. And what goes on is a wonderful sort of merry-go-round, which I'll describe by taking out these examples. About eight or nine months ago, the remuneration committee at Bass, the Brewers, decided that their chairman, who was a man called Ian Prosser, deserved a rise of 33%, which would bring him to 593,000 pounds a year. Sitting on the remuneration committee was a man called Sir Geoffrey Mulcahy, chairman of Kingfisher, which owns, among other things, Woolworths, and his remuneration committee had just given him a rise, uh, bringing him up to 1.3 million. The Kingfisher remuneration committee was chaired by a man called Sir Nigel Mobbs, who's chairman of a company called Slough Estates, which had had a very bad year indeed. Profits and dividends were down, which is not what you could say for the decision of the remuneration committee at Slough Estates, which was that Sir Nigel should get a rise of 7 or 8% com compared to all the falls everywhere else, bringing him up to 312,000 a year. And on the remuneration committee at, at, uh, at Slough Estates sat Sir Christopher Harding, chairman of BET, whose remuneration committee had decided that he should get a 25% rise, bringing him up to 540,000 pounds. And I could sit stand here all afternoon showing you how the little merry-go-round goes round that these so-called non-executive directors who give these chairmen these enormous increases are themselves by usually chairman or executive directors of other companies who themselves are being rewarded in this fantastic way. Nothing whatever to do with the performance of the company, but to do with the performance of greed, which exists right throughout those boardrooms. I mean, there really isn't any other explanation for share options except to say that we found another way in which we can reward ourselves. That is, people who sit on boardrooms can reward themselves. They give themselves options to buy and sell shares in the same day. So you don't, if the shares go down, obviously you don't Exercise the option. The word is exercise. The exercise required is to lift a telephone. That is the, is the movement. Actually, nowadays, with new technology, you don't even have that movement. I think it's that, really, isn't it? You, you press a button, and you buy and sell a share in the same way when it's gone up, obviously not when it's gone down. And all over, every single day, literally every day of the week, if you read the Financial Times carefully, some executives somewhere have rewarded themselves by the most extravagant amount of money simply by this process. I pick one out from the cross row. I have no particular axe to grind. But the chief executive of Mirror Group newspapers, <laughs> uh, a man called David Montgomery, I don't know if you've ever come across him. I, I certainly haven't. Uh, he, he, he took over in, uh, in 1993, in November 1993, in a boardroom coup. And the very first item that appeared on the agenda after he took over was share options. Share options for the chief executive. The very first item, the, sh the shares were rather low at that time because the mirror had been doing rather well and the workers had been doing rather well and we had a decent strong trade union in there and therefore the share price was low. He came in to smash the trade union, build up the share price as a result. And although the Daily Mirror are now selling something like 700,000 copies less than they were in 1993, although all the papers in the mirror stable are doing much worse than they were doing then, although as if to show how brilliant he is, he's brought up the independent newspapers, which are all doing much worse than when he first took them over, David Montgomery the other day cashed in his share options, which he'd given in 1993, given himself in 1993, to the tune of 1.3 million pounds to himself alone.
Yorkshire Water, I picked this again from the cross row, probably for its enormous success in drying up the entire county, probably one of the wettest places on earth, managing <laughs> to achieve a situation where there was no water for the people. What happened as a result of there being no water for the people in Yorkshire Water? In 1989, the year that Yorkshire Water was privatised, the directors of Yorkshire Water got £200,000 total. The chairman, who was a man called Gordon Jones, got 75000 far too much, of course, even then. In 1995, six years later, when there was no water at all for the people of Yorkshire, the directors were getting £641,000, a 300% increase, and Gordon Jones was getting £189,000. Now, the same people that were the directors under the state enterprise are now the, the, the directors who have tripled their salaries in both cases. And if you think £189,000 isn't enough, which is what they think now in the City of London when they're chair, chairman of companies, uh, he awarded himself uh, share options and exercised them, bringing him in a total of £158,023 in 1993 to top up this enormous increase in his salary. And it is an astonishing fact that in all the great privatised utilities, in power, telephone, gas, in every single one of them, you find this consistent theme, that there is in none of them any increase in production over the period in which they have been privatized. There is not a single extra watt of power in electricity companies being circulated in this country. Hardly a single extra uh, 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 production line in terms of telephones. In gas, there is no real increase in production whatsoever. You have that running on the one hand, and on the other hand, you have this absolutely unimaginable increase in the pay of the people who are running these companies. In pay, in share options, in enormous increases in their pensions and their bonuses, each bumbling over each other, if you like, to earn more and more money from the lack of, uh, the lack of extra production. I take another example, one that's right before us now, which is the privatization of rail track, and hold in front of you as a sort of paragon of this whole privatization and sleaze process, the former Secretary of State for Transport, Mr. John McGregor. Mr. John McGregor, when he was going through the process of privatizing the railways, appointed as his chief advisor at a salary of £150,000 a year for a two-day week, Sir Christopher Foster, a senior partner in Coopers and Librands. If you want to know a shorthand for Coopers and Librands, I always remember them as Maxwell's accountants, if you want to be filled. Feel safe. If you feel safe with Coopers and Librands, always remember that they were Maxwell's accounts. Coopers and Librands, by the way, while he was appointing Sir Christopher Foster as his main advisor on privatisation, he appointed a, a firm to advise British Rail on the question of privatisation. You've guessed it, you've got the right firm, it's Coopers and Librands. They got 1.7 million from British Rail while their senior partner was advising uh, the Secretary of State as to how to nationalize it. Two questions arose for the Secretary of State. Who should be the chairman of, uh, of Rail Track? Not very difficult. They look around and see who they were at school with, or rather university with. Uh, John McGregor was at St. Andrews University with a man called Bob Horton, who is so arrogant and offensive that he was the only man ever to have been removed from the board of BP for arrogance and offensiveness. <laughs> the only man in all of history who has achieved this was immediately chosen by John McGregor, because he knew him at university, uh, to be the chairman of Railtrack. He is still the chairman of Railtrack. Then another question, who should be deputy chairman? Advising John McGregor was Sir Christopher Foster, who came up with a brilliant idea as to who should be deputy chairman of Railtrack, Sir Christopher Foster seemed an obvious. The trouble was that he was advising the Secretary of State on privatization, and even under the rules that exist now, which are ne negligible, it was difficult to see how an advisor to the Secretary of State could become the Deputy Chairman of the body which he's advised the Secretary of State to set up. So what happened was that in a day, a kind of miraculous metamorphosis, uh, Sir Christopher Foster was changed. Before midday, he was the advisor to the Secretary of State. After midday, he was, he was deputy chairman of the company he had advised the Secretary of State to set up. After setting up Rail Track, McGregor went off to become a director of Hill Samuel, which had been paid several million pounds to advise British Rail on the channel, on, on how they should operate in the Channel Tunnel. Uh, and, and you'd have think that that was a conflict of interest, wouldn't you? And then you remember there's a thing called the Nolan Commission, which was set up to deal with conflict of interest, sleaze in public life. 
So the Nolan Commission called John McGregor to stood in front of them, said, come on, Mr. McGregor, you're going to have to explain yourself. How could you possibly be, go into a merchant bank which has paid the, your pension all the time that you've been a Secretary of State because you were with the merchant bank when you were a young kid and they've paid your pension all the way through and you go back from the Secretary of State advising uh, 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 privatizing rail track and you go back. Uh, what about it? What have you got to say? To show you the kind of vicious attack that was launched on McGregor by the Nolan Commissioners, I read you out what Tom King MP, Tory MP, who is a Nolan Commissioner, said to him. He said, I will embarrass you now, John, by saying I always thought you would be Chancellor of the Exchequer. And they all giggled and laughed and snickered, and that was the end of the attack on John McGregor. <laughs> Perhaps the most extraordinary part of this Slees story is the one that's normally referred to as Quangos. Wrongly, I think, it's got to be called Egos because extra government organizations is what's actually at stake here. And this really is perhaps one of the great changes that has taken place in the shape of our national life over the last 10 years, is the way in which what they call the new magistracy, a new section of people have taken over powers over money which used to be dealt with by elected authorities. There are 63,120 people in charge of these new extra government organizations. They handle wealth to the tune of 35 billion pounds a year, which is now half the value, and rapidly rising, by the way, of everything that is done in this country by local authorities. I'm talking about 1,025 grant-maintained schools, 557 further education corporations, 629 National Health Service Trusts, 2,628 2, housing associations. All of them self-appointed bureaucrats, self-appointed organizations, bu bu bureaucrats operating institutions which previously were run by elected organizations. Schools with the local education authorities, same with the FE corporations, the NH trusts run by area health authorities which had a large elective element in them, housing associations running uh, houses which were previously run by elected associations and so on. Now who are these new magistracies? Magistrates, magistracy. They're almost overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, something in the tune of 92 percent insofar as it's possible to tell what their political allegiance are Tories. There's one hospital trust in Kent which has achieved the record out of six people directing the hospital trust. There are four former Tory officers and one Tory MP's wife. That's five out of six and that, although, although that's a record, that is not exceptional in the way in which uh, people are appointed, the reasons in which they're appointed. And the people that are appointed are overwhelmingly bourgeois, petty bourgeois, some big capitalist but mainly petty bourgeois, all the people that prop up the capitalists in, their, in the way in which they go about their business. Um, they are looking after themselves or their friends. They are almost universally corrupt. And their new power in all these institutions, GM schools, FE corporations, NHS trusts, housing associations, their power, their bureaucratic power, removes them a lot from the public gaze as to how they can carry on and therefore inevitably makes them more corrupt. They're not, as the old public authorities were, open to inspection. Their registers, their registers aren't open to inspection. They're registers of conflict of interest. They don't have to hold public meetings. They won't answer press inquiries. I just to take one example, just as someone who constantly is dealing with this, that uh, uh, there was a woman called Pauline Latham. Anyone who comes from Derbyshire will know who she is. She was the leader of the Tories on, uh, uh, on Derbyshire County Council for years and was part of the, the systematic Tory campaign in which Edwina Curry and all those other people took part, Oppenheim and the rest of them, against the uh, bookbinder and the, uh, uh, and the, and the, and the, the, the Labour leadership in, in Derbyshire County Council. Pauline Latham was made a member of the funding agency for schools, which is the quango that operates on schools. And as she was made a member, so all the new grant-maintained schools received colorful brochures through the, uh, th through the letterbox saying, would you like to uh, do any, ch any repairs? Any repairs? We'd like to recommend you an architect, Latham Associates. Derek Latham Associates, the husband of Pauline Latham. Now, when I asked the funding agency for schools a question if you had asked previously the Department of Education, you'd have had an immediate answer. How many schools 
actually took on the architectural work of Pauline Latham's husband, who's a member of your agency, they say it's not our business to answer you that. That's entirely a matter for the school and for Miss Latham. And I asked Miss Latham about it. She sent me a photograph of herself because she said it was more attractive than the one I'd already published. And cases like that, you wonder whether you should just throw in the towel altogether. Now, <coughs> I'm, one of the arguments about the quangos put up by the government is that they are regulated. They always say that, don't they? There's a regulator. And one of the interesting things about the regulators is that they are, by and large, uh, the same people that are po they're poaching, the gamekeepers. The, they're, 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 they're the gamekeepers are the poachers. Uh, they are the same people. I mean, that funding agency for schools, which I mentioned, is chaired by Sir Christopher Benson of Sun Alliance, which is a, an insurance company which insures most of the grant-maintained schools over which they operate. You remember the wonderful story of the, the, the person who regulates the lottery, Camelot, who went out to America and was immediately offered a, a, a plane to go around the country to look and see how wonderful the, uh, the, the lottery is in America. And the plane was paid for by GTEC, the American part of Camelot, who immediately got the contract, which this chap's meant to be regulating. And when Virginia Bottomley said that she couldn't see anything wrong in that. They can't really see anything wrong there. The regulator, it goes around in planes operated by the operator he's meant to be regulating, and that's perfectly all right as far as Virginia Bottomley goes. It, there's, a, there's an organization, perhaps the worst example of this, there's an organization called the Environment Agency, which takes over all the work of, uh, uh, of previously quite honorable institutions. I mean, things like Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Pollution and the Nuclear, Nuclear Inspectorate and, and, uh, and the National Rivers Authority. And these organizations which were out to see that people didn't pollute. And they were staffed by people who knew about pollution, whose job was to stop pollution. And the staff, even right up to the top, was composed of people who, if you asked them at any rate, would say, my job is to stop pollution. All these powers have now been handed over to this environment agency, whose chairman is the fourth Baron de Ramsey. I expect, you know, you immediately know who is, don't you, the fourth Baron de Ramsey? At once, you can say, oh, I know him. He's played a great part in public life. He's obviously somebody very important. Well, the only part in public life that I can find is that he has been, for a short time, a director of a water company which has the record for mass prosecutions for pollution uh, in this country. And the other qualification, I think, which was much more important, was that he is chairman of a ward in Huntingdon, of the Tory party in Huntingdon, which is, as you know, the Prime Minister's constituency. He's also chairman of the Country Landowners Association, which is one of the bodies against which most of these anti-pollution agencies are constantly battling and fighting. Country Landowners Association should be called the Country Polluters Association. That's what they are by and large. The chairman, Baron de Ramsey, the fourth baron, I don't want to get him or his line wrong in any way, but the fourth baron de Ramsey is a former chairman of the Country Landowners Association. Other people on the body include Brian Alexander, the former managing director of Northwest Water, which was prosecuted four times for desperately bad pollution in that kind of part of the world. Christopher Hampson, the sitting chairman of Ready Mix Concrete, one of the great polluters in this country, the dredging company which knocked out the Marchioness and killed those people on the Marchioness whose, whose dredger knocked out the people on the Marchioness. And John Norris, another dredger, he's got a consultancy with Ham Dredging which operates all the way out on the border of, of, of East Anglia. And he, by the way, is a former, just to round the thing off, is a former chairman of the Country Landowners Association. The whole thing from top to bottom in terms not only of the quangos themselves but in terms of the regulators of the quangos, the whole thing is one great mass of corruption and conflict of interest. Now, as he ask what the ideological answers from all this, because you could talk all day about it, of course, but just come to some sort of ideological conclusion about it, we turn automatically to William Waldegrave, the great liar, one of the great liars of our time, you know, the man, <laughs> man who said that uh, the, the guidelines had not been changed when he'd actually changed them. Do you remember? And held on to office afterwards, just obviously the man who should be Chief Secretary of the Treasury. You could tell, you see, most people could tell the difference between they've been changed and they have not been changed. Most people can immediately tell the difference. Walter Gray says there's no difference philosophically because he's a fellow of all souls. And he can tell philosophically there's no difference between changing a guideline and not changing it. There isn't any if you really think about it hard. <laughs> he was asked on the question of whether, um, of the quangos, he says this, the key point in these arguments is not whether those who run our public services are elected, 
but whether they are producer responsive or consumer responsive. In other words, it really doesn't matter about elections. Elections are really quite irrelevant. Whether these people are chosen or not doesn't matter. The fact that you have a self-appointed magistracy, oligarchy, imposed now where uh, local authorities used to be in charge and health authorities and the like is of no consequence because they are producer responsive or consumer responsive. And yet, the truth of the matter is that in all these areas that I've mentioned, in every single one of these areas, the truth is that the discipline of the market drives out the element of public interest, relaxes the regulations, and leaves the people at the top free to sack people, pollute the countryside, and exploit at will. That is true in the further education colleges, it's true in the grant-maintained schools, it's true, it's becoming increasingly true in the housing associations, it's true in all these areas in which the Quangos have taken over this area. There isn't any argument for any of this sleaze. There's no argument it is not true that the fat cats are more able the fatter they get. In fact, it's quite obviously the opposite of the truth. The fatter they get, the less able they become. The less able they come to deal with the situation. I mean, look at the performance of that man, Cedric Brown. I mean, it was almost unbelievable that such a man should be in any position of any of authority, of anyone in any sensible society. You'd find that chap something to do with a blackboard, wouldn't you? You'd find him something to do on the side of society where he didn't interfere in anyone because he's a, a plain bungler and imbecile that you put him on one side. This chap, is the fatter he got, the more incompetent he get. It's not true that the quangos are any more efficient. It isn't true that the grant maintains schools are any better at providing education or the further education corporations are any better, that education's any more available in any of those schools that they were or that the education in them is any better. It's not too true that there's any more housing or that housing is any more reliable under the housing associations uh, than they were uh, under the old local authorities. None of these things are true in every case all their arguments, which argue for this uh, distraction of power right up into non-elected bureaucracy, are simply, uh, they say, arguments don't stand up. And so when we come and ask, how is it? What is it all about? What's the root of it all? The answer seems to me quite absolutely plain. It seems to shout out from the whole record of it, and that is that it's a question of class. See. The class is a theory, it's not, it's not something, when people say that, oh, we live in a society of plunderers, sometimes when they use words like that, or marauders, the, the image that people create is one of a, a lot of individual people plundering a lot of other people. Well, that does appear to be what's happening. But what's actually happening is that all those people that are plundering are part of a class, which means that they have a certain solidarity with one another, that they have things which bind them together in their common interest, and their common interest in a, a political will to make the world an easier place to exploit in. They need a political will, a solidarity, a class interest, just as we need that solidarity and class interest, so they need it. And then if you think of sleaze as something which is just a lot of individual sets of corruption, then it seems to me that you miss the point. What's been going on here for the last 10, 15 years in which this huge increase in sleaze has taken place is a deliberate class attack upon institutions which they found got in the way of making life, uh, uh, making life uh, easier, uh, making the, pl the world an easier place to exploit. For instance, municipalization, the centerpiece of Labour's strategy when Labour first gets the vote. The center idea that you go and locally take over places and run them as municipal operations, the municipalization was one of the, uh, one of the areas uh, which they found a nuisance because you couldn't make money out of things which had been municipalized. Nationalization was something which got in their way because you couldn't make money out of the things that had been nationalized, all those utilities, the health service and so on. You couldn't make money out of them so it got in their way. And so they, as a class, they set themselves, through their government and through their appointed representatives in government, they set themselves the business of smashing up what got in the way of exploitation for them. In particular, the municipalization and the nationalizations of the 1940s, 50s, and even the 1960s. So that at the beginning, here we are in the middle of the 1990s, we have a situation in which they have created a situation in which they are almost rampant in their ability to steal money uh, from the rest of us and, and to, uh, and, and to uh, uh, revel about in their own sleaze.
Now here's just one interesting point. Old labor was to many, it's a great deal responsible for creating that municipalization and that nationalization. See, when in national, if you look back and say, are these things relevant to Slees? Certainly they are. If you look back in the 1940s, you asked about Slees, parliamentary Slees in the 1940s, it hardly existed. I mean, they set up a whole tribunal because one junior minister had taken a bottle of sherry from somebody or other. Now, nowadays, you'd set up a tribunal if they hadn't taken a bottle of sherry from someone or another. A whole, an MP was expelled for having a public relations agency. Now you get expelled if you don't have a public relations agency. I mean, there's a huge difference between the time, if you like, when we were winning, when our side were winning. There's a huge difference in the level of corruption to what there is now. Old Labour was responsible for a lot of that. The incredible thing about new Labour is that even though what's going on... Uh, subverts their own power, their own elective power. They show no interest whatsoever in, first of all, in resisting this process. They've been pretty well silent in resisting this process, but certainly no interest in reversing this process should they get back that parliamentary power. I mean, I went to Leeds once to expose a development corporation, which was the Leeds Development Corporation, which was the story of the most almost staggering and unbelievable corruption land corruption, the man in charge standing to make 20 million by moving, by developing a rugby ground in the middle of the city. And I found to my dis amazement that sitting on the development corporation were the, de the chairman and the, the, the leader and the deputy leader of the Labour Council. The leader's now member of parliament, needless to say. But they were sitting on the development corporation which had seized these planning powers from the council itself. Hardly a complaint. Oh, you've got a job for me on it? I'll go on it. So you find that there's really very, and where I saw an article by Jack Straw in the Daily Telegraph suitably the other day saying that he, uh, he won't sack the Tory nominees. He's not going to sack the people on the Tory quangos. That, he said, would be neither fair nor reasonable. They see it as a fair, uh, you know, we must be fair to them. They're not fair to us, but we must be fair to them. That's not how it works. It doesn't work like that. It's a class operation. They seize for themselves, and if our side won't seize back, then they will simply become richer and more confident as a result. There's nothing exclusively Tory about Slees, don't forget about that. Anyone who thinks that should uh, conjure up in their minds the picture of Bettino Craxi, the leader of the Italian Socialist Party, the great hope of Italian socialists for many years, he used to be the great leader that really run the city of Milan. Now Bettino Craxi is sitting in a palace in Tunis, afraid to come back into Italy for fear of being arrested on uh, on, on corruption charges. And the social democratic administrations of Felipe Gonzalez in Spain, Francois Mitterrand in France are riddled with corruption from top to bottom. Because the whole operation of, of, of capitalist society is so biased towards the people at the top, the idea that you can go in at the top and change it almost always means that the people who go in at the top to change it end up as corrupt as the rest of them. Byron had a phrase, all corrupted things are buoyed like corks by their own rottenness. They go to the top, always go to the top, and therefore the only way in which we conceivably change it is from below. And incidentally, just for one second, incidentally, what happened in Leeds against that corruption was that it was effectively defeated by a councillor that stood out against the other Labour councillors in Leeds about them going on the, on the corporation and the like, and built up a great campaign against the developments that were planned there and effectively won it. Now, it, it, it slees, people talk about it, just to conclude, people talk about it as though it was an excrescence on the rim of the system, a sort of boil on the body politic which has to be, has to be lanced so that the system can continue more healthily. Uh, uh, they, they say that capitalist rules are there to preserve the way in which capitalism uh, works and when capitalist rules are broken, uh, that's corruption. Well. I've always found it increasingly hard to find the line between the corrupt breaking of rules and the corrupt rules themselves which protect a corrupt society. And I, I chuckle a little when I'm told constantly patronized by people in society who say to me, oh, we need people like you to expose the corruption in our society. Uh, my reply is that we need people to expose the society which breeds the corruption and to change it. As Shelley says, let the axe let the axe strike at the root, the poison tree will fall.
I, I became a socialist um, 35 years ago uh, when I was 23 or 24. And the first question I had to deal with was, what about Russia? Is Russia a socialist country? And is that the kind of society we want? And that was the one thing that held me back from socialism, actually, at the time, because it seemed to me that uh, you mentioned the Berlin Wall. I mean, any society which set up a wall to keep people inside it couldn't possibly be described as a socialist society, because, you know, if you were a socialist society, you would be, as it were, trying to keep people out rather than trying to keep, get people from going out of it. So the whole thing seemed to me very odd. It was very bureaucratic, very dictatorial. It wasn't democratic society at all. It didn't seem to me to have any element of socialism, the sort of elements of socialism which I thought mattered. And so I joined the smallest organization that then existed, which had no more than about 50 people, who were socialists, but who said that Russia was a state capitalist uh, uh, society, that it wasn't the, the, the essence of it, that is the control from above, the exploitation from above, was the same in Russia as it was in the United States of America, Britain, or anywhere in the West. The essence was the same. It was capitalist in the West, state capitalist in the East. The forms were different, but the essence was the same. Now, that was a very small organization when I joined it. It had perhaps 30 or 40 members. Um, now it has uh, thousands, I mean, and it has been the only, perhaps 10,000 members, and it's been the only organization on the left, the only socialist organization which has grown and held its position uh, over the last few years since 1989 because we've always said that's not what we're aiming for and we always had the slogan neither Washington nor Moscow but international socialism. It was possible then uh, for us to survive the terrible uh, onslaught which socialism, socialists had to face after the collapse of communism. This corruption of these last few years, this, this rush, this kind of gold rush that's gone on as the dismantling of the welfare state everywhere in Europe has created a pile of booty over which uh, the ruling classes, in Britain of course, Paul knows every single member of the ruling class and can name them. That's just in case anybody, there are still some people remarkably who argue, well there isn't really a ruling class anymore, well we send them to Paul and he'll name them, you know. <laughs> but um, um, that ruling class is here, but it is international too, and as we know, the French Prime Minister deals in property or really large flats in central Paris for his family. The, uh, the, as we know, the men, most of the social democrats, Christian democrats and socialist leadership is now unfortunately absent long term from Italy, exploiting the gains of the last 20 years. And in Spain, there isn't a single member of the, uh, the ex-socialist party cabinet who was not involved in some form of corruption or not, except of course for the Prime Minister, Felipe Gonzalez, who when asked where half a million dollars from Siemens went when it was offered to him personally he said I never saw it my secretary took the check <laughs> but uh, let's be very clear the new regime the new conservative regime in Spain which has taken over is part of the same system and will operate in exactly the same way uh, but maybe at the end of telling the story over and over and exposing and revealing the rottenness of corruption uh, of these people we also have to ask well why I mean why, why is it happening and they have an answer too both on the Tory and the Labour side. And let's underline that. When people are taken into a corrupt system and when they are di divorced and disengaged, uprooted from any form of control or responsibility or accountability, they become corrupt too. I read with surprise last week, for example, that the MP for the Gorbals, one of the poorest districts of Glasgow, a man called Jimmy Ray, who began his life as a kind of bookies runner, has just bought a house outside Glasgow for £300,000. Now, obviously, he's a very, very, very thrifty man on the rotten wages MPs have got, I can't understand how he could have afforded it. But uh, apparently, according to Ron Mackay in his column in Scotland on Sunday, he did it by selling watches. <laughs> I leave you to ask yourself how many watches you sell to buy a 300,000 pound house in the country when you start off in a rat infested flat in the Gorbals. Anyway, but that aside, and the answer comes to us, well, it's just that society has lost its sense of morality. So in a sense, it's not our fault. There's a general atmosphere in which the values of morality, solidarity have gone, and we're just one more example of it. Nothing we can do about it. It's beyond our ken. And our answer, really, I think, should come from that message that was read out just before I spoke. They have their 
are their morals and there are our morals. They have always been corrupt. Sometimes they concealed it better than they do now. But they have always been corrupt and rotten and venal. But there's always been another morality, a morality that existed in the day-to-day -day life of ordinary working people without, without idealizing anything. But when it comes, for example, to somebody uh, on a picket line, the morality of the, of the working class movement, of the trade union movement, is a morality of solidarity and collectivity. In other words, there is an alternative model of social behavior. But the thing we have to remember at the end is they get away with it because we allow them to. They get away with it because our confidence is low and the leaders of the working class movement have shrugged their shoulders and said, well, that's the way it is. These are the values that prevail. We can do nothing about it. Our answer is there is a model in everyday struggle which tells us a different way of doing things about it. There is another morality and on that basis we should build a fight against them which will not only expose them but remove from them the ability to lay their, their filthy hands inside this pile of gold. In fact, we'll redistribute the gold altogether and put them on the blackboard at the side of the road. Now, I know Paul's got connections with the Southwest and will be very familiar with Southwest water and its goings on over many years. But most notoriously, there's in the last couple of years been several outbreaks of um, a disease called cry Cryptosporidium, particularly in the Torbay area, where they managed to infect several hundred people. Um, fortunately, it didn't kill any of them, but made people very ill. Now, uh, at the same time as this happened, just before um, the, the case came to a public inquiry, the chief executive of Southwest Water resigned so that he couldn't actually be implicated any further. It's just come out that he was given a payoff deal of £800,000 when he left his job. Now, this has shocked the powers that be so much, apparently, that there is going to be a further inquiry, etc., 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 which will take years. But nonetheless, this was apparently quite acceptable to the board of South West Water that this man who presided over not just, you know, a drop in share prices, not just, um, you know, poor productivity, but actually sending, you know, sending into hospital hundreds of people who were the consumers of the product that they were supposed to be providing in a safe and clean way. And in actual fact, they were very lucky that they didn't kill quite a number of people because if you happen to be immunocompromised, like you know, if you've got HIV or if you've got leukemia or if you're on chemotherapy for any other type of cancer and you get cryptosporidium, it will kill you. So it was you know, pure chance that they didn't actually kill quite a number of people. So I think we need to remember that it's not just, you know, we all were kind of, you know, uh, laugh and are horrified at the, the sheer amounts of money these people get, but the impact on people and their health and their well-being is quite dramatic in many circumstances. I used to be the shop steward for Swansea City Sewers Department, and one day um, four chaps were sacked, for 18-year-olds, were sacked for uh, spending five minutes late uh, uh, in the chip shop. They were sacked. Um, they, they walked off the job straight away, went to the guild hall and said, can we see somebody big? Because the problem is, the, the, the foreman that sacked us has had us working one day a week on his house, um, doing, it, doing his drive, there's been a lorry there, there's been a bricklayer. Straight away, they, they took him in into the personnel department, the doors were closed, I wasn't allowed in. Um, the local TNG branch said, isn't this disgusting, these people reporting their foreman. And um, the, the point is, every worker knows that the place that they work, uh, you know, that there are these dishonest things happening. Another case, uh, I, was the, I was the printer for Corgi Toys Swansea, and when women came out of the factory with a car worth 50 pence, if they stole a car worth 50 pence, they were taken to court. And the factory manager there would be in his suit, um, saying, making sure that these women were never employed again. One day I went to the security on the gate and I said, I've seen a lorry load of material stolen today. What are you going to do about it? They said, don't be silly, Andrew. You're making up stories. I said, no, a lorry load was stolen today. Cardboard from Hong Kong, it was stolen. What are you going to do? They said, well, okay, tell us the picture. Who stole it? I said, the factory manager stole it. Um, it he claimed it was damp. He used it and he claimed the insurance on it as well, so he got the price of it twice. The chap in Hong Kong has worked it out, now he's got on a, on a plane and they've got to fiddle the insurance two ways. Um, the, the point is every person knows 
the, the, the corruption in their own place and I have not yet had a, a boss who hasn't you know, fiddled vast sums of money. Somebody asked whether we should pay any attention to the newspapers. And the question's phrased, I think, in one of those slightly sort of sectarian way, in the sense that if we, did, I mean, if we didn't pay any attention to the newspapers, I don't suppose any of us would be here, actually. We wouldn't have discovered anything at all. Uh, if you never listened to the radio, never watched television, never read the newspapers, you would be extremely ill-informed. You know, we, even, even if you said, well, all I read is I only read the socialist work, I don't read anything else, you'd still be, and I, I want to get expelled for this, but you'd still be a little bit ill-informed. You wouldn't have quite the wide range of knowledge that you perhaps you ought to have and, and, you know, then uh, when, uh, when Mary says that, uh, Mary Smith says that um, the, Goodman ex the Goodman scandal was exposed by a journalist, that's true. The, uh, uh, the um, Kinkora scandal in Northern Ireland was exposed by uh, Dublin newspapers. The, uh, um, the Aitken scandal and uh, B Mark and the, all that thing, all that stuff, uh, all that was exposed in one way or another by, 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 by journalists writing in what are plainly... Um, capitalist media, but nevertheless able to get their stories in. So there's a contradiction there which you want to keep always in mind. It is as the things going on inside media, like for instance trade unions, or people trying to build up trade unions, that in, it's no accident that it is in the papers where there is some kind of trade union presence that is the paper by and large which does m m m much more exposés than, than, than the ones that haven't got any trade union presence. I mean there is still uh, pretty well uh, an NUJ closed shop in The Guardian, which is, and that's why, it's, it's, it's the best uh, national newspaper, because what, what comes out in that, in that paper is likely to be better than what comes out elsewhere where they have no unions. I mean, those contradictions go throughout our society. They certainly go uh, through our society generally. Nevertheless, the point is, the basic point is absolutely correct. And one of the things that's interested me in this whole uh, sleaze operation over the last 10 years is the way in which the press and in particular, the local press has been sucked into it. I went up to Leeds not long ago with a television company to do an expose of that corruption I mentioned earlier about the Leeds Development Corporation and, and the rugby club development there, or the development on the rugby club land. And I was, uh, one, of, one of the things I noticed was that the original plan had been put up by a company called Mountley, which was run by a man called Clegg. Mountley had gone bust before, just before it had gone bust, Clegg had cleared out making a personal fortune himself of 80 million pounds. And then shortly after he'd gone, the, the thing collapsed. They went to interview Mr. Clegg. And where was Mr. Clegg? He was the chairman of the United Leeds, I think it's called the United Leeds Hospital, but it's one of the very big hospitals in Leeds. I remember the infirmary, the United Infirmary, you'll know it, the people from Leeds will know it. One of the big hospitals in Leeds. He was the chairman of, of this trust, which ran the, this new trust, which ran this hospital. And on his board, was the managing director of the Yorkshire Post, the Yorkshire Evening Post, which run that chain of newspapers in Leeds. So they were pulling in. And so when you, when you criticize, say, why have you got a property speculator of the most disgusting variety, of the most revolting variety? When we interviewed him, he had a huge picture of Margaret Thatcher practically kissing him above his thing. And he was, I mean, the most, dis he's saying we want to get back to the old days where rich people could care for poor people by, you know, going around the wards and looking at them and giving them some money out of their pockets. He's this sort of man, how can he be chairman of a big hospital trust in Leeds? You ask that question, one place you won't ask it with any great fervent at all is in the Yorkshire Evening Post. And I was, you know, wasn't surprised when we finally got our program on the air. The, big, the most vicious attack of all that came on the program, not on the corruption, but on the program, was from the... Yorkshire Post. So there is this, uh, the media themselves, of course, are owned in this same corrupt way, and they instinctively side with the corruption that they're meant to be uh, exposing. i just come back to the, the fundamental point, which Mike Gonzalez so beautifully set out there, just in case there's any doubt about it. I mean, the system is corrupt. The, the capitalist system is, by definition, corrupt. A system founded upon exploitation on a group of people unaccountable to the rest of the society, robbing the rest of that society, must inevitably be corrupt. The way in which it will be posed to us, by and large, will be in terms of people saying, well, this is corrupt, that is because, as I said earlier, it breaks the rules of the system, or it goes beyond. Of course, I think 
wonderful speech from the, from the comrade from Swansea who spoke about you know, his experiences. I mean, it is true that they're all corrupt, but it's also true that some are more corrupt than others. And the ones that will be exposed to us, or constantly, you know, certainly for us journalists, but those you know, in general in society when we're dealing in local branches and the like, we're dealing with local problems, the ones that will come up will be the most extreme. The ones where the, all the workers uh, from any particular enterprise spend all their time uh, making the boss's house look nice or uh, mending the boss's car, down to the uh, situation where very little time is spent there. So there's, there's a great range, if you like, of corruption. And the ex ones that will be exposed to us will be the ones that are the, uh, the, the worst of them. And we, therefore, take those cases up. It isn't an excuse. It, it's a, the worst thing of all is to say, oh, well, the whole society is corrupt, so we're not going to take up this particular case. I mean, our further education college, something is going on which is disgusting. It has nothing to do with us because the whole society is corrupt. Or, you know, that is not an excuse for not taking something up. On the contrary, you take it up, you raise it, and you raise it much more fearlessly, almost recklessly, because you know that the whole society is corrupt. It's why all the time, wherever you look around, the people who are taking, people who are ringing me up at private eye even, but the people who are taking these things up are members of the Socialist Workers' Party. They're socialists who say, we can't stand this any longer. Look what's happening. And it's, it, it, they seize on the, the most corrupt cases and expose them, and they do so the more fearlessly and the more confidently because they know that the whole damn society is corrupt from top to bottom and because they want to change it.